If he does things which are out of bounds, which are improper, I will pin him down, as I have. It's hardly the language one would expect from a, a Democrat. It's the language one would expect from a demagogue. He doesn't just defame me, he's defamed almost every other minister. And today he's a bankrupt. I've paid well over $1.5 million, Singapore dollars, in damages and costs um, for libel suits brought against me. Although he is now 80, Jay Rutnam still hopes to clear his debts and one day make a political comeback. Lee Kuan Yew has no such ambitions. In 1990, he retired as Prime Minister. And the mantle of power passed seamlessly to his successor, PAP loyalist Go Chok Tong. My own mission when I took over was how do I keep Singapore going? But I'm not Lee Kuan Yew, I can't govern like him. I did not fight for independence. I took over Singapore uh, in a sense uh, with everything in good working order. But obviously the style of government must change. Go Chok Tong promised a kinder, gentler society and a more open political culture. Opposition politicians became a more familiar sight. There were more political parties, more debate. But the floodgates never opened. Elsewhere in Asia, long-standing governments were toppled by a wave of popular feeling. But in Singapore, support for the PAP never dropped below 60%. As long as it has kept delivering economic success, most of the people have kept voting for it. This government has been so long in power. They genuinely believe they are the best government for Singapore now and in perpetuity. And do you know, I... I'm almost sure that they want to be a permanent government, not for self-glory, but for the good of the country. So you, you have this kind of situation that some of us who like a little bit of noise mess, a little bit of even unruliness, might describe as antiseptic clinical. The challenge for Singapore always is how do you maintain stability? Because if you lose stability in Singapore, you lose everything. I try to explain it to my friends with a very simple analogy. I say that if you live in America, it's like sailing across the ocean in an aircraft carrier. You can jump up and down, the aircraft carrier is not going to shake. But when you live in Singapore, it's like sailing in a, in a sort of small canoe. And if you, if you have one or two people jumping up and down the canoe, the canoe will sink. In 1993, Singapore's political system became international news when American teenager Michael Fay was convicted of vandalism. He received a hefty fine and was sentenced to four months in Queenstown prison. And while there, he was to be given six lashes of the cane. Michael Fay is to be tied to a trestle and punished with a rattan cane. Each stroke splits the skin. After three, victims may go into shock. His crime was to spray paint 18 cars and steal some road signs. He is going to bleed considerably and may have permanent scars, and I think it is a mistake. Why should there be a law for the Americans and a different law for, for Singaporeans? So I thought the Americans believe in the rule of law. <laughs> Obviously, when an American was to be punished under uh, foreign law, the Americans were unhappy. Despite intense lobbying from the US government, Michael Fay was caned on the 5th of May, 1994.
The only concession the Singaporeans made was to reduce the number of strokes from six to four. Some Asian diplomats said to me, gee, you know, if we had caught an American and the American ambassador had come to us and said, you know, uh, let go of him, we would have quietly let him go. We wouldn't have put him in jail. You not only put him in jail, you caned him. <laughs> so it was a way of actually demonstrating, in a sense, how fiercely independent uh, Singapore was. I myself had uh, difficulty in uh, making an appointment to see President Clinton in, 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 in the first, uh, I think, first two years or so. The White House aide did not put the request on Singapore up to the president. <laughs> so, so we just got to accept it. By the longer term, it was good for us that Singapore was prepared to stand up against mighty America. A spicy mix of oriental contradictions whose rulers worry... The world's media were fascinated by a country that seemed so Western on the surface, but had such a different approach to social control. In this super-clean Asian city, there's even a ban on chewing gum. Chewing gum is banned. There's an offence of picking flowers in a public park and a heavy fine if you're caught. And if you use a public lavatory and don't flush it afterwards, you could get nabbed by undercover environmental health officers. Foreigners may object, some may laugh at us, but not too long ago, many Western societies would have done what we do. It's just that it's now gone, this, doing these things have gone out of favour in Western society. We are a conservative people, almost Victorian in some of our values. And I believe that on caning, if we were to put it to a referendum, on chewing gum, if we were to put that to a referendum, you will find that the overwhelming majority of Singaporeans will support these policies. Western critics were dismayed that Singaporeans seem so docile and willing to accept the rule of their leaders. They've experienced the most dramatic increase in standard of living that any people have experienced, probably ever since the beginning of man. And then you ask these people, why aren't you revolting? Why aren't you going out on the streets? Well, why should they? Singapore may have stood firm over the Michael Fay case, but in the years since, it's made a conscious attempt to soften its image. Its government is acutely aware that to keep attracting foreign investors, the city needs to be more appealing, more fun. In recent years, Singapore has been marketed as a city of the arts, good food and nightlife. Some of its straight-laced Victorian values have given way to a more vibrant, lively culture. The government wants to open up, it wants to change. They are allowing a whole lot of things that, in fact, are astonishing to me. You know, I've observed the scene and said, oh, the government allows bar top dancing. But it's in the political domain that they remain adamant and a little bit squeamish about opening up because I suspect this is one area that will challenge their entrenched position. The risks are greater there. In the year 2000, Singapore's government responded to its critics by creating a speaker's corner as a haven for free speech. Okay. 